Thank you, Bill. Good morning to everybody. Good morning. Great to be together today. It really is. What a blessing. What a blessing to be together here to worship God and uh, to be in each other's company and fellowship and presence. Really, really a blessing. We really appreciate that. If you're visiting with us, we do hope you'll fill out a visitor's card. Just leave it on your seat so we have a record of your presence here today. And if you're traveling, be safe. When you're back in this area, come back and see us again. If you're visiting from the community, please come back as often as you have the opportunity. This morning, I want us to talk about something that I want us to focus upon something that is about as basic to our spiritual well-being and ultimately eternal well-being as we could possibly contemplate. I want us to think about asking the question, why am I a believer? Why am I a believer? And you know, when probably we don't stop and think about that very often. But there are a whole lot of people, and polls tell us, public polls tell us, however accurate they might be or inaccurate, but they tell us that more and more people are questioning about being a believer. More and more people are coming to the point where they're saying, I don't, don't really think I do believe in God, in Christ. Well, why am I a believer? And I want to tell you some things that I think not only can relate to me personally and my understanding, but I think can relate to every single one of us here today. And also then that we can share with others and help them understand why they need to be believers and not just in a passive way, but in an active and obedient way, a dedicated way. Sometimes we, we say, oh, I'm, I'm absolutely a believer, but our dedication level starts to wane and go down. And we need to understand that is not okay. Why am I, believe, am I a believer? What does it mean to be a true believer in Jesus Christ? Now, I understand and agree with what the Bible says about Jesus. That's basic. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 14, again, as Bill just read a few moments ago, Paul said, first, whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he went into a practical, logical process of how a person comes to that particular point. And understand, Paul is not saying, stand someplace and just say, Lord, and then you're going to be saved. Remember what Jesus told Ananias to teach Saul of Tarsus. And Paul recounts that in Acts chapter 22 in verse 16. And he said, this Christian man, Ananias, sent by the Lord came to me and obviously he taught him the gospel. We don't, you know, some of that we understand reading in between the lines of the scripture verses there. But he then asked me this question, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling in the name of the Lord. Calling in the name of the Lord, what? In my, in my obedience to the response to the gospel message, I'm calling in the name of the Lord for my salvation, for my forgiveness, for my redemption. So I understand, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then Paul says, how then shall they be, how, how then shall they call on him of who they have not heard uh, or, or have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And so he goes through that logical process, and then in verse 17 he says, so then faith comes by hearing the word of God. So I develop my faith within me, my personal faith in Jesus, as I get into his word and learn about Jesus in all of the texts of scripture that talk about him. So what does it mean to be a true believer in Jesus? I understand and I agree with what the Bible says about Jesus. And so there's a reason why the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 to study or be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My faith comes as I understand God's word and come to believe it and I'm ready to make the proper applications to my life, obedient applications. And so I need to study. I need to be diligent in studying God's word so that I can understand what it is that I need to believe. Well, it also, to believe in Jesus, to be a true believer in Jesus, as I've just said, includes not just intellectual understanding and agreement, but it includes obedience. In John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, in the night of his betrayal, 
If you love me, keep my commandments. He repeated that in verse 21. He repeated that again in verse 23. And then he repeated that in inverse action in verse 24. And so it's not just, again, saying, yeah, I believe. But it's just a verbal thing. It's just an intellectual thing. No, Jesus says, if you truly believe in me, if you truly love me, you're going to obey my commandments. You're going to obey my teachings, live by them consistently and obediently. The Hebrews writer, speaking of Jesus himself, said, having been perfected, he became the author or source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Not just agree that he exists, but all those who obey him. They agree so much, they believe so much, that they want to live by his teachings. Now, here's the big question. <clears throat> Why should I be a believer in Jesus? And I'd like to make that more personal, and I hope you'll make the personal application yourselves as we go through this. Why am I a believer in Jesus? with all that belief includes. So not just believing, saying, yeah, yeah, I believe, I believe, but all that that belief includes. My obedience, a lifestyle. Well, a true believer in Jesus experiences some very specific blessings that do not come in any other way except through being a true believer in Jesus. And again, that means obedience as well. Are there any advantages over not believing in Jesus? If I'm a believer, do I have an, you know, any advantage over not believing in Jesus? Does it make sense to believe in Jesus as God's Son and my Lord and Savior? Well, a true believer in Jesus first is forgiven. You know how many people are out there wanting to be forgiven of sins in their life? Wanting to be forgiven for something they've done that they know is wrong, even if they don't you know, categorize it specifically as sin. They know they've done bad things. They want to be forgiven. How do they get forgiven? Being a believer, a true believer in Jesus, I'm forgiven. Again, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 Ananias, sent by the Lord, came to Saul of Tarsus, who had been a horrible, violent enemy of the church and of Jesus, tried to compel Christians to blaspheme the name of Christ until he came to his senses, until he was con confronted by the Lord himself on the road to Damascus. And Ananias said, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And that's important because... If I'm still in my sins, then the wages of my sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I, if, if I'm a true believer in Jesus, then I've been forgiven. And I have that promise of eternal life. I have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1 and verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And true belief, including obedience, leads to forgiveness. I begin with my faith, and that leads me to obedience, which then leads to forgiveness. Acts 10 and verse 43 to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And if I understand the, under, the, the true meaning of that word remission, translated remission from the Greek, it means, boy, completely wipe away, obliterate any record of those sins. That's total, absolute forgiveness. It's at baptism into Christ that I come into forgiveness. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when many of the Jews asked Peter and the rest of the apostles on Pentecost, what shall we do? They just heard the gospel being preached to them. They just heard about Jesus. Many came to believe. Peter said, repent. You did not believe before. You did not follow him before. You did not obey him before. You did not come to him before. Repent of all of that. Change your mind and let that change your action. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for 
the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But a true believer also is justified. In Acts chapter 13, beginning with verse 39, we read, And by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And so here, Jewish people are being preached to. They've lived under the law of Moses. They, the, apparently, those who are being preached to, a great many of them, were still living under the Old Testament law of Moses. And so they're being told here, living under that old law, you could not be justified completely. But by, every, but, but by him, by Christ, everyone who believes is justified ultimately and completely. And that is through the grace of God. Romans 3 and verse 24, Paul wrote, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Again, notice the key, in Christ Jesus. That's another reason why I am a true believer in Christ. But a true believer in Christ also is a brand new creation. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, justified by his grace, I become new. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, the apostle Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, again, understand the basic necessity there, Believing in Christ, being in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Have you ever thought at some time in your life, I sure would like a do-over. I sure would like to be able to go back and change things. But we know that once that time is passed under the bridge of life, there's no calling it back, is there? No calling it back. We can't go back and, and, and make some mistakes we've made not have happened. We can't go back and kind of start time all over again and erase those things that we've done that we regret having done. But coming into Christ, I've been made new. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I get that do-over. I get that restart. Now, that does not mean those things that have happened will not have happened, but I get a brand new start on life. And I can change everything from this point forward. I get that do-over. Interesting. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, Paul says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, that means he was not a part of you. To, in this sense, this very pivotal sense, before you were baptized into him. You put him on, and again, that's another sense of this change in my life from a spiritual perspective. I was once away from God. I was once far removed from him. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 12, says that at that time, and Paul is writing here to Christians at Ephesus. He's reminding them of the transition of the new life that they have taken up, that they have been blessed with having become Christians. He said that at that time, before you became a Christian, before you were baptized into Christ, before you became to believe in him so thoroughly and so fundamentally that you, you wanted to change your life, you wanted to come to him, you wanted to own him as your savior. At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having, and look at this, and this is where so many people are in our world today, having no hope and without God, no hope. If I'm without God, I have no hope. Having no hope and without God in the world, but now, and there's that transition word, but everything's changed, hasn't it? But now, in Christ Jesus, and there's the key again, in Christ Jesus, having become a true believer 
a true obedient believer in Christ. In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What a great blessing. What a great blessing. Being a true obedient believer in Jesus, I'm also sanctified in Christ Jesus. And what a great term that is. We'll talk about it in a moment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul addresses this first inspired letter to the Corinthian congregation in this way. He says, the church, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, who are with, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. See the connection again with being a true, obedient believer in Christ. Paul addresses them as the sanctified in Christ, called to be saints. The sanctified, what does that mean? We think of sanctuaries and we talk about how, okay, here is a wild animal sanctuary or here is a bird sanctuary. And we're talking about a place set aside for the protection and the preservation and the growth of whatever it is that has been sanctified through that sanctuary. But now that's great, but that's on a physical plane. When we're talking about being sanctified in Christ, we're talking about being set apart from the world because we have made that decision, becoming a true obedient believer in Jesus, to change our lives by God's grace, that he would change our lives. He would, we would be born again, made new, and we would change our focus in life. We will have been set apart from the world in that we have become Christians. We have been forgiven. We have been justified. We have become a new creation. And so we have been sanctified, set apart unto holiness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning of verse 9, take a look at all of those things that we have been sanctified from. Paul wrote, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And this was just a representative list of sinful practices that will keep us out of heaven. And such, Paul goes on to say, and such were some of you. But, here's that transition word again, but you were washed by the blood of Christ as you were baptized into him for the remission of your sins. You were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our God. Wow, what a transition. Sanctified. Just think of all those things, all of those acts of sinfulness that I have been sanctified from, set apart from, by virtue of having come into Christ and been forgiven, been justified become a new creation. What a blessing. Being a true believer, true obedient believer in Christ, I've also become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And boy, that's, that's difficult for us to really fully wrap our minds around, but in somehow, in some way, the, the Holy Spirit is with us by virtue of our having become true believers, true obedient believers in Christ, having become Christians. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 19, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? And you are not your own. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 13, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Somehow, the Holy Spirit is with me 
I'm, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's unique to being in Christ. Having become a Christian. Being a true obedient believer in Jesus, then I'm blessed with forgiveness, with justification. I've become a new creation. I've been sanctified from all of the worldliness. I've been set aside unto holiness in Christ Jesus. And I've become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Being true, obedient believer in Christ, I'm also delivered from condemnation. Delivered from condemnation. In John chapter 5 and verse 24, Jesus said, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life has passed from death into life. Now remember what the wages of sin are or is? Death, Romans 6 and verse 23. Remember the rest of that verse that we read earlier? But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Jesus said, if you truly believe in me, if you truly believe in me, believe in, in, believe in my Father in heaven, who sent me, you have everlasting life, and you've passed from death into life. So I've been delivered from condemnation. In fact, Paul wrote in Romans 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's the key again. We keep seeing that, how all of this is central. All of these blessings are central to our being in Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. What a blessing. And being a true obedient follower of Jesus, I have been adopt I have been the recipient of all of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1 and verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now to whom is Paul writing? Again, to the church at Ephesus, to those who have become Christians. And he says, you have become the recipients. God has bestowed upon you all of the spiritual blessings by virtue of your having been baptized into Christ. Again, notice, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed us with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Over and over and over again, we see the centrality of all of these very special blessings being related to, being conditioned upon our being in Christ. They come through our relationship in Christ. Being a true obedient follower of Jesus also means I have been adopted by God the Father as a son or daughter and I've become an heir of God. In Galatians 4 and verse, uh, ch chapter 3 and verse 29 if you are Christ's there's the condition again. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And then a little bit further in chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul goes on and says, Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. When I became a Christian, when I became that true obedient believer in Jesus, God adopted me as his son. Now that's unique to everybody outside of Christ. They're not adopted by God into his family as his sons and daughters. They have not become heirs of Christ or heirs of God because they're outside of Christ. The key is, again, through Christ, in Christ, God adopts us. 
And that's unique to, be, to being a true obedient believer. And again, that means an obedient follower of Christ. Adopted by God. What an incredible blessing to contemplate. Being a true, obedient believer in Jesus means I'm saved. I have everlasting life. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, we know that familiar verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In verse 36, he who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not obey the Son, and there's the coupling of belief and obedience again, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. I have, I have everlasting life. I've been saved. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus told the apostles as he was ready to ascend back to heaven following his resurrection and having presented himself risen before hundreds and hundreds of believers for a period of 40 days, he tells them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. That salvation, that everlasting life, again, is only promised to those, is a blessing only for those, who have been baptized into Christ. True, obedient believers. And then, the result of all of this, why am I a true, obedient believer in Jesus? Yes, I've been forgiven. Yes, I have become justified. I have been blessed to become a new creation spiritually. I have been sanctified in Christ. I have become somehow the temple of the Holy Spirit. I've been delivered from condemnation. I've been blessed with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. I have been adopted as a son or a daughter, an heir of God. I have been saved. I have been promised eternal life. The result of all of this a peace that is so profound, that is so unique and special, that is far beyond anything this world can possibly offer me. John 14 and verse 27, even as he was ready to go to the cross, Jesus told the apostles, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What an incredible statement. What an incredible promise and blessing. Peace. Romans 5 and verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul wrote in more detail, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. He said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Anxiety is the opposite of peace, isn't it? The absence of peace. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, not the peace of the world, not the peace of some human government, let the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, and I would suggest to those who have not experienced it, will guard your hearts and minds, here's the key again, through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Whatever turmoil that this world may throw at us, whatever problems or challenges the devil might present us with, the peace of God 
is ours. We can see our way through that because God has said, I've got you. I've got you. You're forgiven. You're justified. You have become new spiritually. You're sanctified in Christ. You're, the Holy Spirit is with you. You're delivered from condemnation. You're blessed with all the spiritual blessings that I offer you. You're my son. You're my daughter because you're in Christ. You're saved. You have everlasting life waiting for you. And so the result of all of this, I have the peace of God abiding in my heart, in my life, seeing me through, keeping me calm. Now, in view of all this, in view of all of this that we've looked at, how could anyone not believe in and obey Jesus as their Lord and Savior? How could anybody say no to that? How could anybody just put it off? How could anybody not believe in and obey Jesus? Now, I think very methodically, analytically, and I get a little bit deeper than that even, and I wonder, what are you hoping for if you don't believe in and obey Jesus? Do you realize what the consequence of that is? I don't believe. I'm not sure I believe. Then you've just lowered the level of your existence to any other animal out there. Because only we are created in the image of God with a soul. And as you come to Jesus, all of these blessings that we have enumerated here become uniquely yours. So what are you waiting for? Maybe you've never thought about it from this fuller perspective of what is offered to you by coming to Jesus, by obeying him, by being baptized into him. Why in the world are you waiting and remaining outside of Christ? The Apostle Paul wrote this, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. He says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. If you could think about it as holding an object in your hand, think of time you've got right now in your hands. You say, oh yeah, but I've, I've got many, many years to, to live, decades even, probably. People die at all ages, unexpectedly. But you've got right now. Why would you not obey Jesus? Would you today, as we stand and sing?